Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us at the McGovern McGinn uh, Symposium, Magnificent Brain Discoveries. Uh, my name is Dimitrios Pantazis, and I'm the director of the Magnetoencephalography Facility at MIT's McGovern Institute. Uh, today's symposium promises an exciting journey into MEG. Uh, we are joined by distinguished uh, speakers and uh, cutting-edge uh, soft representations. Our main program includes uh, lectures from three prominent uh, speakers, um, very prominent in the field of MEG, Professors David Popel, Leila, Leila Isik, and Sylvain Bayer. Uh, following a brief, brief coffee break, we will continue at uh, 3.45 with presentations showcasing three popular MEG uh, software toolboxes. The m &E Python, presented by Mainak Jass, Brainstorm, presented by Sylvain Bayer, and Fine Neuro, presented by Noam Pellet. Uh, and finally, we will conclude with the reception at 4.30 p.m. Um, before we begin, I wish to thank uh, our lecture and soft representation speakers. And importantly, I wish to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the McGovern Institute and McGinn for their invaluable support in making this symposium happen. Uh, their institutional and financial backing has really been instrumental in uh, uh, ensuring the success of this uh, event. I want to send my special thanks to the McGovern Institute, represented by Bob Desimon, the director, and Gay Latson, the director of administration and finance, for their un unwavering support. Um, and also Sarah Frank, our events coordinator, for her exceptional dedication and seamless coordination. She, she made my uh, life much easier by taking care of everything locally here. And of course, uh, McGinn, uh, who is a global leader in MEG technology, for their commitment for customer support. And the MEG Triux machine, their flagship uh, product, is the device we actually have here and has been the most popular instrument uh, over the last decade for MEG research. So special thanks go to Jim Petit, the business development executive in McGinn. Uh, he has committed uh, to the success of our lab and always provided uh, support. And I know him for uh, over 14 years now. He has been always very cordial. I considered him a trusted friend, and he has been key in conceiving and organizing this symposium. And also Nicole Suri, uh, Gab Richardson, and Zoe Etter in the marketing team in McGinn. They've done a magnificent job in, uh, in uh, organizing this symposium, too. And um, with this introduction, I want to proceed um, with the symposium lectures. We we'll have about 45 minutes for each uh, lecture, which will be about 30 minutes presentation time, and then we'll have enough time for Q&A. Um, and let me, with that, let me introduce our first uh, uh, speaker, uh, Professor David Popel. Uh, David Popel is a professor of psychology and neural science at New York University and the scientific director and CEO of the Ernst Strungmann Institute for uh, Neuroscience in Frankfurt, Germany. He was the director of the Department of Neuroscience at Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt from 2014 until 2021. And an interesting fact, he actually completed his undergraduate and graduate training with a PhD in 1995 at MIT um, in uh, in cognitive science, linguistics, and neuroscience. So welcome back to your alma mater. Um, nice to see you here, really. Um, David Popel has been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin, um, the American Academy uh, Berlin, and a guest professor at numerous institutions. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And his research employs behavioral and cognitive neuroscience approaches to study the brain basis of auditory processing, speech perception, and, and language comprehension. Um, he, had a, he has a nice provocative title um, about the importance of, uh, in his talk title, about the importance of MEG in uh, neuroscience of language. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to leave the floor to our speaker.
Thank you very much, Demetrius, for the invitation. Thank you, McGovern. Thank you, Nicole, Jim, and Gabrielle for co-organizing. Thank you for coming and hopefully staying. Um, I, I do have a very emotional relationship to MIT because um, when I was about this big, I went to MIT day camp for a bunch of summers. And when I was this big, I was an undergraduate at MIT. And when I was this big, I was a PhD student in this very department. So I, I feel like I have a lifetime commitment to, to the Institute. Um, so, my, so I think this is supposed to be kind of an advertisement. So what I'm going to give you is a kind of smorgasbord of findings to stimulate you or stimulate you to debate or whatever. Um, I will not leave you time for questions, maybe 15 seconds. <laughs> so if you have questions, interrupt, please. And this is supposed to be, you know. Um, so the idea of, of course, we all care about you know, these techniques that we, in, let's say, the cognitive neurosciences use in this historical context as we put people in things that are, uh, that generate some data, which is coming out the top here. That's sort of the parts list of the mind and the parts list of neurobiology, right? And so this is what, so uh, that, that is uh, what we're trying to do. And I'm gonna focus on, you know, informally speaking, speech and language. So to get into, the, into this very quickly, you all know what speech is, which is what you're doing right now, unless you're reading. Uh, you're listening to me. Uh, the input is some kind of linear sequence of sound. Uh, it looks like that. Now, that's important. Is that what language processing is about? No. That's one of the things. Because what else could it be? Those of you who are reading, I see you. It could be reading. It could be sign language. It could be a tactile signal. So all of these things are part of a system that you have to get your head into. Um, you might have the same at the level of the output. Right? So you have some kind of sensory motor interfaces. We can all agree on that, right? So you hear, you read, you can generate the output. And through the genius of PowerPoint, there's some space in the middle. And so that must be filled with something. And so let's call that more, you know, let's say, language per se, uh, which has at least two things. In your head, you have a bag of words, or you can call it a lexicon or the inventory or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you have to have procedures to deal with those things. So you have to have procedures that concatenate things, generate structures out of them, maybe relate items to each other because there are dependencies between things and so on and so forth. Right? So this is the one slide summary of all of speech and language. Um, and now you're done. And I will just, in uh, my allotted now 44 minutes, go very rapidly through a series of experiments that highlight uh, just some findings of these different domains. A little bit about the input, a little bit about the, let's call it central system or language per se, and a little bit about the output to give you an intuition of what kind of experiments we can do. Now, we all uh, know and love MRI-based research because it's done, you know, it's sort of the engine of much of cognitive neuroscience. It's excellent seating right here, um, business class. Extra leg room. Um, and, but, if you're dealing with, with um, questions that require temporal dynamics, MEGs turned out to be particularly useful and important. So um, here's your typical um, example. So you know, in the uh, important words of John, Paul, George, and Ringo, baby, you can drive my car. It's a good example of a sentence. Uh, the top is the kind of signal that arrives at your ear. The middle thing, which has a lot of you know, strange annotation, is a sort of, it's a phonemic transcription, and that's what's called, as you know, a spectrogram. So it has time and frequency and amplitude. And that's the kind of stuff that, let's say, your auditory pathway builds. And then down here is a sort of slightly different view, which is a waveform with this kind of red outline, which is a, the envelope of the signal. So that's the kind of stuff that ends up in your head. And so I got interested in this through a project many years ago and it, that sort of um, fascinated me that was actually originally motivated by a study on uh, using crickets. So a cricket, crickets don't vocalize, they fertilize, right? They rub their feet together. So, and there was an interesting study by Kristen Machens and colleagues on trying to figure out how do you actually decode these things or can you actually find interesting differences? Here, up here, sit, sit down. Steve Stuffelbean, up here. I see you're late, so you have to sit up front. I call him out. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Front, now you have to sit in the front row and I'll call on you. <laughs> Bummer, huh? When you come late. So the first study we did was uh, uh, on this, in this line of research was actually really um, championed and developed and done by Juan Luo, who's a um, professor at the University of Beijing Psychology Department now and is doing uh, really fabulously interesting work on, on working memory, for example. And the idea was the following. If I just play you a bunch of sentences, let's say one, two, three, we wanted to know, is there anything in the signal at all that makes, it, makes you be signal one or two or three? You know, how, how might we do that? And we adapted or adopted and adapted this analysis strategy that was you know, very much straightforward for systems neuroscience and said, well, look, if I go and I look at these different sentences, can you see? Because I can't see my, you know, I guess you can see my mouse, right? Um, if I, so you know, we're talking about single trials of sentences. So I give you a few sentences. Each sentence is, let's say, three or four seconds long. And then I give you a whole bunch of different things. So you're lying in the machine, you're hearing these sentences, some are good, some are bad, right? And the idea is this, very straightforward. Suppose I just line up all the uh, trials to a given sentence, I don't know any averaging, and sentence one, sentence two, sentence three, and then the presupposition is that there's something in that signal that's more similar for those sentences than some kind of control that's called a cross group. I just like, throw a bunch of trials together. Right? So I, I align them all and I say, well, there must be some interesting relation, there must be a similarity relation between all the trials that are elicited by the same sentence. Right? So then you might say, okay, well, the within group comparison might be different than the across group comparison. And the more, most obvious thing to look at is the inter-trial coherence or the inter-trial power, all the other things that you can do. So on a given, so how do you do it? You take one, one trial, so just four seconds of data. That is something you can do with MEG. You heard it here first. So just four seconds worth of data in real time. And then you say, well, I want to look, look at what's going on across these trials. I'm going to look at the inter-trial uh, relations. And what you find is, is pretty interesting. So here's a kind of result. Um, down here is you know, the, the, the thing to look at. So this is frequency on the x-axis uh, for a given channel. This was recorded in 160 channels, and here it is for a bunch of channels. And you see there's only one, uh, where you're looking at, at now is dissimilarity. So is there something similar in the within and the across group or dissimilar? And the dissimilarity is focused on one region, and this is the region in the theta band. So the theta band here, for practical purposes, we defined as from 4 hertz to 8 hertz, so it's a really, relatively low frequency neural signal. And it turns out that the phase, but not the power, right? so this is the power, and this is the phase. So the phase of the theta band is a signal property that actually distinguishes between different trials and different items, different sentences, and so on. So it's very sensitive, based just on a few seconds of real-time recorded data, which is a useful property. So then you say, well, okay, let's use that. Now I, have a, I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking at the phase pattern to one sentence. It has you know, X many, and now I'm gonna use that as a classifier to figure out, can I you know, uh, figure out which sentence I actually was? And that turns out to be really useful. So just the phase pattern of a single trial will tell you, am I an X, am I a Y, am I a Z? Right, so single so phase of single trials is a really good sensitive index. Now you can start playing interesting games, like for instance, uh, making the materials more difficult, modulating them in interesting ways so that it's no longer intelligible, right? So you mess with the thing. And you get the same kind of, you get very lovely uh, sensitivity of the phase pattern. So, so far, so good. So, it ha so theta, the, the, the response of the theta band has the right uh, sensitivity. It also has the right specificity. So you can take a given sentence and do all sorts of manipulations to it, as you can see in this kind of vertical column. So you can make it just the fine structure, the envelope, four channels of an envelope, you can do noise vocoding, you can do all kinds of weird things to make it sound complicated, but you still get the unique marker of what that sentence is. So it has sensitivity, it has specificity. Okay, who cares, what does it mean? I mean, what is that signal? So it turns out, you know, well, the theta band, as I told you, is about four to eight hertz, well, it was four to eight hertz as we defined it for this analysis. So that's you know, a time period of you know, ballpark 200 milliseconds. So this is, and since it's just phase resetting over and over, 
what the conceptual idea is it's just a w window that slides across every 200 milliseconds or so. Right? So it's like a, a, a sampling of whatever is going on. So that turns out to be pretty, pretty useful because now you know what you're looking for and you have a time scale that seems to be grouping things into some perceptually relevant thing. Okay, good, that's nice. So what is it that you're, what is happening at roughly that scale? Well, in baby you can drive my car. If you look at the bottom here, you see the envelope. Right? The envelope of the sentence was the outline of the power. It uh, turns out to be the thing you, that's at the same time scale. So maybe what you're actually tracking in this, with this theta phase response at the low frequencies is something about the envelope of the signal. Should you care? I mean, this is some kind of weird, you know, idiosyncratic fact about our lab. Well, you should care because here's what an envelope is good for. So suppose I take a whole bunch of different languages and a whole bunch of different envelopes. Let's say in Mandarin, in American English, in French, and you say, I want to actually quantify the properties of the envelope. I want to know what's, you know, what is its structure. Is there something systematic about it, or is it just every everything different? And it turns out when you do that, you can do, you know, we're not going to harass ourselves with the minutia and read all about it. It turns out that the envelope across languages and across speaking styles and across everything is extremely regular. Right? So. Um, here it is just for English for different things like audiobooks, sentences of the timid corpus, the buckeye corpus, which are interviews, the switchboard corpus, which are conversations. You can go on and on and on. And it's actually remarkably regular in its distribution. Right? So this is the modulation spectrum of speech. And then you can do it for a bunch of different languages. And if you get really into the minutia of this, like my uh, Florencia Asanio, a former postdoc of mine who's done wonderful work on this, you can do it for funky languages like Zulu or Marathi, Turkish, it works wherever you want, whether you're looking at it as a perceptual signal or as a spoken signal, or you can decompose it by different articulators. So it's a feature, right? So it's a feature of the output that has high degree of temporal regularity across language. So that's great. And we know from MEG, EEG, ECOG, all the kind of tools we like to use, that you just entrain to this envelope. Right? So the envelope is a signal that's su sufficiently strong. It's sort of, you can, the intuition is it's a little bit like luminance contrast in vision. It's, very, it's a very obvious big signal contrast that you can exploit. So people like Juan and Nai Ding subsequently did a number of experiments on trying to quantify precisely how this works. So you really entrain to this signal. Uh, and it can be music and it can be speech. Uh, Keith Doling, a former a grad student of mine, did some you know, very elegant studies on, uh, on speech and music for this. Okay, so now we have an, so this is the kind of index that you can use even in single trials. And what, so what's the message? I mean, what's the takeaway from just this kind of single early study? Well, it's, so you get an interesting linking hypothesis, right? So you get a linking hypothesis between, you, you discover something about the brain that we know, we, so we exploit something from systems neuroscience. We exploit something from physics, namely the modulation spectrum. And we exploit something from linguistics, namely, what is this duration a duration of? And it's the mean duration of syllables across languages. So this is a known known, right? So now we have an interesting uh, plausible input-related linking hypothesis. So physics tells you speech is this kind of signal that has to do with, obviously, also your jaw movement. Um, Neurobiology says, I'm in training to that signal. And linguistics says, oh, that's useful. If I have a chunk this size, I know what to look for, whether it's by a bottom-up process or a, a top-down process. So far, so good? OK, so we have a chunk. So on the input thing, we have identified a chunk that's roughly syllable-sized. But that's not all we're interested in. Obviously, we're interested in more stuff. So for example, uh, it's nice and good to have some kind of acoustic chunks or syllables, but I really want to understand, baby, you can drive my car, or ka, as apparently. This must be the British. Baby, you can drive my car. So I must be able to go inside these uh, units and actually figure out the, uh, the, the details. So to do that, you have to you know, go one level inside of this, in this particular interface, right? So the acoustic. And so this is uh, just a brief experiment. And I will uh, keep it brief, because I know you heard from uh, her last week, my former uh, grad student, Laura Williams. So Laura. Uh, she and I share sartorial ch uh, choices. 
which are poor, <laughs> obviously not ideal, but hey, it is what it is. We, I have to say, we did write to that true company and said if they want to sponsor, <laughs> sponsor the lab or sponsor anything, because like, look, we all wear the same shoes. We had a third person, another post, we all like, they did answer. They tweeted back at us, so that was nice. Um, so here's a very different kind of experiment, still on the same kind of genre of problem. So you put people, now I want to know, can I decode point by point the, in, the syllable internal structure, the phonemic structure of speech, right? That was what is, distinguishes a word from another word look. So here's what, what Laura did. So suppose I put now a bunch of people in, a, in, a, uh, in an MEG machine, and I have them just listen to a bunch of stories in this case. It was 21 people. They listened for two hours to a bunch of stories, so really you know, fun times. Uh, and the idea is, well, can we identify, uh, using a decoding approach, what are the units uh, and how fast, slow, reliable do you, can you decode in this kind of signal what's going on? Uh, so now we, of course, want to now no longer remember that in the previous one I just told you, well, the envelope's a great signal. We use it wisely and so on. Now we want to actually uh, not deal with these big acoustic variations. So first you take the signal, you regress out, for instance, the envelope, and things like pitch variation, just the, fund the variation of the fundamental frequency. You want to be left with the acoustic phonetics of the item itself. So then you're left with some uh, residual signal. That becomes the input for your, for your uh, decoding exercise. Uh, very, so the experiment itself is very simple. Right? You're just, again, listening to this stuff. And then it becomes a kind of, uh, as all studies these days, uh, for better or for worse, a kind of orgy of regression. And so the first thing you see is uh, you can tell. So the upper left, let's just focus on the upper left because you know, I don't want to be, uh, is the decoding times for, for instance, obvious things in individual phonemes. So nasality, being a vowel, being voiced. Or uh, manner, uh, the, you know, these are things like uh, being an approximate, a fricative, a plosive, like ptk, ptk or something like that. Uh, place of articulation, like where in your mouth is the thing. So you, you see, uh, I, I don't want to go down this path because this is an extremely long, methods heavy paper, but you can detect and decode features uh, between, you know, for let's say ballpark 250 to 300 milliseconds duration, starting after 50 milliseconds, very successful, from brain data. Now, is are you just simply decoding acoustics? So you can do the same experiment just on the acoustic signal. So you do the same thing you do uh, there. You you know same number of channels, slightly different uh, uh, signal, but you do the same in this case back-to-back uh, -back regression analysis, and you find you can decode something from the spectrogram, too. So, of course, there's interesting stuff in the sound. There's interesting stuff in the brain. Is, is one simply a direct reflection of the other, or is there anything more interesting? And it's a bit more interesting uh, and a bit more. And the message from this kind of study is like, look, um, first of all, so here it is aligned. Here's, like, here's a word boundary right in the middle. So here's the, here's the end of one word and the beginning of the next word. And each phoneme is aligned now, you know, visually separated a little bit to make it clear, to show you a kind of just some kind of principled relation between the acoustics of something and the neural signals of something, right? So we want to see, is, there, is this a direct reflection or is there an interesting transformation? And it turns out that uh, overall, you can, you, know, you can decode stuff for very long, which is interesting because items themselves aren't very long. Unlike syllables, which are about 200 milliseconds in duration, the phonemes in these kind of studies are on average 80 milliseconds. So if, in, if you can decode something for 300 milliseconds that was only there for 80 milliseconds because everything's super transient in addition, something else must be going on, right? So you must be putting that somewhere and carrying it with you. So that became the core part of the study. So here, for instance, just to show you, this is a temporal generalization kind of analysis um, where how long you know, is something available? So here's the first phoneme of a word. So this is equivalent to this right here. But you see that the second one and the third one are still decodable for a long time, as are the ones that go backwards. So for any given moment, you seem to be carrying information in a kind of larger thing. And the kind of beautiful result, I mean, just to, to highlight this, is now you know, from the syllable down a level to phonemic information is this kind of colored 
finger plot or something like that. So everyone, here's the vertical line is the uh, word onset. And here's each individual phoneme. And you can see that each one is on for a while, as you can see in this kind of, uh, in the diagonal of the temporal generalization, right? So this is uh, testing time versus training time. And, and they're offset regularly by roughly the duration of what a phoneme is. So you're like, okay, who cares? Well, the reason you have to care is because it does two useful things for you perceptually. On the one hand, it keeps, if you look at the, the arrow left to right, it individuates individual phonemes. It says, I'm, I'm in this, I'm a this, I'm a this. It doesn't, there's not some giant gemisch of stuff, but it individuates as they go along. So that's good because you don't want to have your representations to be completely on top of each other and undifferentiable. If you look at the vertical arrow, it shows you that at every given moment, there's at least two, three, maybe four that you can decode concurrently that you're carrying with you. So, and it doesn't matter where you are. So it's independent of position. So a given sound actually has a long identity. Uh, it's, so it's sustained in some sense. It's done in parallel with other friends. And it's invariant with respect to where you are in the thing. So it, asks, it answers some very fundamental questions about the relationship between these local, fast-changing elements and their relationship to larger things. Okay, so that's the kind of thing you see uh, just dealing with MEG signals of speed. You can get a lot. Now let's go to the um, structure. Again. Let's go to the middle section. Very, uh, you know, there's that, that, that's really not languagey yet. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering how to consolidate the findings on the, um, like the long phonemic sequences with more than just um, central receptive windows. So when you use amplitude, you just kind of go with a log phoneme as a center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not supposed to ask hard questions. I was, I was, I was guaranteed no hard questions. <laughs> but um, so STRFs you see in earlier auditory, you don't see that so much in STG, for example, right? So this kind of stuff is actually decoding much more from STG. So you're right about the spatial resolution is not as optimal as you might see, let's say, in a ferret recording of an STRF. But look, STRFs are also can be pretty extended. And if you look at an inventory, I, I happen to just do this exercise of all possible STRFs that have been looked at in the ferret auditory cortex, there's a wild zoo of these. So I don't really see much of a, I mean, now for early auditory cortex, that's one thing, but I don't see a tension between the properties of STRFs and the properties of an extended possible representation in STG. Uh, and note, by the way, as I think I said here, so just because you can decode it doesn't mean it's used. Right? It means you can decode it. I mean, we can do all kinds of fancy stuff now. But your point is well taken. Maybe a more punctate thing that's more, uh, is, is the more appropriate view. So I don't think we should over-interpret a decoding view like this. So I think you're, you're, um, you are allowed to ask that. So. But I don't see the, because I think the spatial differentiation of where we measure STRFs versus this kind of stuff is actually important because receptive fields are longer there. And even longer as you go, for instance, to STS, right? Much longer. So, anyway, I hope. Um, OK, so now let's go quickly to, I don't want to do this because I don't want to take away time from, I want to go to this since we're on a decoding exercise. Let's continue um, with the uh, structure building thing. So one of the things that's been done for a long time that's actually been very uh, uh, successful and then investigated by lots of different labs, not so much my own, is that you can frequency tag structural representations, not just the signal itself, like I just showed you here, but actually abstract internally generated representations. So as I'm hearing something or speaking to you, I'm building pretty complicated uh, structured representations like in, oops, oops, I guess I don't have it here, you know, like uh, that are, uh, hierarchically structured reflect dependencies that are sort of the bread and butter of the language processing per se when you strip away the sensory motor interfaces. So here's, here's a, an experiment building on this again. So you take another you know, bunch of victims. They're listening to long short stories. Um, 
Uh, now we have, you know, again, tens of thousands of items per participant, thousands of words. We have a lot of data to, to do this. But now we want to ask a different question. So if we, we know from one kind of experiment that you really get regular markers of abstract linguistic representation. So now I want to know, um, well, how does that actually work in terms of the time domain? Because I'm not, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not just interested in saying, well, there is structure. Can I actually make a processing model of it that has any kind of uh, useful um, detail? So here's a hierarchy of possible uh, features that you might look at. So for instance, just vowels or just nasals. These are sublexical things. Oops. Um, sorry, this is all very hypersensitive, this thing. Uh, things more at lexical levels things that are more structure, uh, structural relations. Right? So word classes, syntactic operations like reflected here in this, like the sentence is the fat cat disappeared. Right? So here you're building an entire more abstract structure and a syntactic state of a representation, some kind of local lexical semantics and so on and so forth. Right? So these are all, this is sort of the bread and butter of working with large corpora these days. You can work with a large language model if you like. Okay, so the idea is the hypothesis that arises from this is quite straightforward in terms of a processing model, which is, well, in what order do you actually do this? Are you necessarily a go from low to high kind of person? So here's one hypothesis, the one that I've always uh, thought was the most reasonable. You go bottom up. You just start with small things and you decode the higher order things later, right? So you get information, you shuttle it forwards and it goes bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that seems like completely like the null hypothesis to some extent. The alternative might be the reverse hierarchy view that Vision has been, you know, in an interesting paper or a series of papers by um, Ahisar and Hochstein have developed like a reverse hierarchy, which is you make a guess at a high level representation and then you go down, right? Also a very interesting idea. Um, so it has a more predictive flavor now, what is it? Well, uh, you know, the answer, unsurprisingly, so here's now our, um, anal our decoding analysis, again, mostly using temporal generalization. It turns out, so look at, at the bottom, let's say, compare the phonetic one to, let's say, something about a syntactic operation. So as you can see, you go up, it starts much earlier. Right? So even though you're, so the kind of radically bottom-up thing, that can't be right in its own right alone. It has to be something more rich than that because the high-level representations are activated first and they are maintained the longest. So they just sit there. You can actually grab that on on your brain data for a long time. Uh, and the local details, like for example, the stuff at the bottom, is actually brief and late. So that's more consistent with a reverse hierarchy view, contrary certainly to my intuition, is you probably make a guess and then you drill down. So this is more like uh, something that our colleague Tom Bever might call analysis by synthesis. Right? You, take a, you make a hypothesis about a high order thing and then you drill down, you make predictions about the level down, level down, level down, uh, which is, and then you confirm it with your incoming data. Pretty interesting. So what we see is, um, Maybe there's a multiple kind of, there's a top-down pass. Maybe there's a compositional bottom-up pass, which is certainly what I have written about before in other papers. And then maybe there's some kind of complicated uh, additional. Okay, so that's an example of dealing with structures that are independent of the sensory motor interface. It doesn't matter whether you're doing reading, speech, sign. These are properties of actually how the type of representation in language comprehension is activated or not activated and when in time. So it's really trying to enrich an understanding of a processing model. Okay, so now finally, I have like five more minutes or something. Who's the timekeeper? Yes. Sure, because there are no questions. So. Okay, so I want to, so here's something completely, and now for something completely different. Uh, because I talked about the input and I talked about the central system a little bit, and now I want to talk about the something about the output. And here, uh, now, something that's a, a little bit more bizarre, uh, which is work by my graduate student, Francesco Mantegna, and a former postdoc, um, Juan Orpea, who's now a professor at 
at Georgetown, actually. If you want a really good MEG analysis person, an thoroughly nice human being, a wonderful person, you should hire Francesco as a postdoc. Defending May 2nd. He does have a kind of lovely offer for a postdoc, but I, I highly recommend him. Yeah. Hire. OK, so these guys work on uh, speech motor control, the other end of the thing. But the idea that I find so fascinating is this is about the mere idea of a speech sound. So I'll show you an experiment or two that's about there is nothing happening at all. It's all in your head, right? which is the kind of stuff people are increasingly interested in. What can you decode nearly inside your head? Uh, and I think it's cool, and it shows you one more time what electrophysiological data of this, time can, of this type can do. So speech motor control has these kind of dominant models, uh, and one of them that's particularly um, interesting is from, um, from Frank Gunter across the road here. Uh, this is called the DIVA model, or there's a more recent, you know, Godiva is a more recent version. Another interesting uh, model of this form is the state feedback control model by another graduate of this department, John Hood. Uh, when he was a grad student with uh, Michael Jordan here many years. He was my office mate, so that was my original model in my head. So this kind of model uh, has a lot of different parts that are independently well-motivated on computational grounds, on psychophysical grounds, and imaging grounds. So there are certain targets, like there's a somatosensory target when you speak. There's an acoustic target when you speak, or an auditory one. There is control, so there's feed forward control as I'm actually about to say my, there's feedback control, I said something and I have to adjust. So there are different control things. And then I have to have some kind of integration because I'm doing stuff coming through the ears and stuff coming from the mouth. So there's stuff in joint space, stuff in acoustic space. So the idea that uh, Joan and uh, Francesco have been pursuing is can we get some purchase on this problem by doing not overt speech because it's hard and irritating, but the mere idea speech, that the planning without doing anything else. So here's the idea. When I do, when I speak, like down here, it's just messy. It's, and, and it remains in MEG research pretty messy, I'm sorry to say. So it looks like, so here's, for example, some MEG data. Here's some EMG, right, because we glue electrodes over people's faces. Uh, here's some kind of time frequency representation. It's a mess. Uh, but if you just imagine speaking, so I say, Imagine saying ba, and you go, okay. It turns out it's really good. You're actually very good, uh, remarkably. Uh, so here's the idea. I put you in the machine. I give you a target, and I say, just imagine saying it. You can train people to do this, by the way. This is not. Uh, and then we glue um, electrodes all over your face so that we have also EMG data so that you're actually not moving, you're not saying. So just remember for the day, there's no movement, there's no sound, there's no nothing. You didn't hear anything, you didn't say anything, you didn't move either. It's in the privacy of your own mind. Uh, so we have a couple of different things to, to say. So for instance, in one experiment, you'll do uh, say pa, say ta, or say ka. Very simple. So the vowel is always the same, but the place of articulation of the syllable is different. In a different experiment, we try ta tu ti. The constant's the same, but the vowel's different. This is, you know, not brain science. And so in one case, you uh, have a little bit more interesting information about the motoric or articulatory aspects and less uh, compelling information about the auditory one. And the other one's the other way around. So you have very clear, lovely different patterns for the auditory representation, if there is such a thing. All right, now we do the experiment overtly first. So I bring you in. And let's just do an experiment to get a good estimate of how fast or slow people speak. I put something on the screen, you say, ba, pee, and so on. Many times, and you get some distribution. And we say, aha, uh -huh, OK, so whatever. 410 milliseconds after a target is when people speak. But there's obviously some, some extra stuff. OK, so that is our overt speech test. There's a kind of a landmark. Why do you need that? Because when you do everything without overt behavior, it's very difficult to time to anything. So, not possible, right? So it's in the privacy of your own mind. So this is what happens. Now uh, we know we have some kind of landmark of, around which we can do analysis. Uh, so that's the overt speech onset. Is uh, turns out to be roughly the covert speech onset. So now the first is, can we isolate these representations somehow? So what are we actually isolating? Is it content specific or is it unspecific? So specific would be like if I imagine. Uh, an ah or a p, 
Am I really imagining that or just some kind of generic auditory experience? And it's not like that. It's very content specific. And it's really more like the notion of an efference copy. That's like one of my, you know, my favorite ideas. And if you, you know, if you run, don't walk to the library and read about efference copies. This is one of the most fascinating, beautiful ideas. So it's not like corollary discharge, which is more non-specific about this. Okay, so can we get some kind of specific thing out of this? Uh, so what you do is you do some kind of time-resolved neural decoding, which is really great to do on MEG data. That's why we're here today, to confirm that that is true and useful. Um, and then the first thing you want to do is, well, can you actually pull out the different representations? I mean, let me, I think the other figures may be better. Uh, yeah, so let's say, take the upper left. I mean, here's you um, actually imagining something here versus just as a control. You can do another control experiment. You're just viewing something. Uh, here is now your decoding, right? So this is time. And then this is your decoding accuracy on the y-axis. And you can see passive viewing is not the same, which is, you know, you have to do a bunch of control experiments. But the interesting thing, and this is really, this is a sort of MEG's central point, is you can decode in space. This is decoding in time. But you can do a lovely job decoding in space and actually decoding the sequence of where and when you're doing something in the process of planning the articulation. And that's what's cool about this, right? So, now remember, nothing has happened, right? <laughs> this is just your, your thought about planning to say something. Because we have a land, so we know it happens roughly before, it's a vertical line here is when you're going to say something, right? So this is the actual overt speech. So all of this before then is your plan to say something. And you can then decode in space where you are at which point in time. So you can put some kind of neurophysiological details onto a model like Frank Gunter's that says, like, look, we need all these boxes to actually accomplish the control part of this task, but we can actually now trace it very precisely in this way. Now, you can, and you can see the differences, for instance, between the uh, vowels and the consonant experiment. So here, let's say you just want to know, uh, this is here regions of interest that you define. You can say, well, how many edges or, you know, pick, pick your favorite measure are there for, let's say, the um, in motor areas for the um, consonant case versus the vowel case, right? So in the motor areas, eh, you know, nothing to write home about, a, bit, a little bit less here for tattoo T. But then if you look at the auditory areas, parts of the auditory cortex, you get a ton for the vowels, which are easy to decode, a clear, stable pattern, and not for the other direction, right? So that's, so you can isolate individual content. Last point. So one of the central claims of these kind of models, of, and certainly of the, the, the DIVA model, is you need feed-forward control and you need feedback control. And one of the more interesting claims about this that's been made uh, in clinical work, okay. fMRI work, uh, by you know, a bunch of fMRI studies, and in animal studies by Nadebohm, by Garcia, Rosales, and Bats, is that you actually spatially segregate control, which seems bold but an interesting conjecture so you have feed forward control in one bunch of regions and feedback control preferentially in other, you know obviously this isn't categorical but there's interesting it's an interesting claim so here's how we investigated this claim uh, here we take a bunch of regions of interest and we look at the MEG signal separately obviously in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere from these different regions and then we want to know well if these are connected and actually underpinning this uh, how are they related? So we calculate, for instance, the, what's called the weighted phase lag index between a signal from over here and a signal from over here and see, well, how are you, in fact, connected um, for all the different pairings, uh, which is, you know, an, and then you get a kind of lateralization. Well, we're, all, we're during the feed-forward phase. Were you more biased here versus there in the feedback phase? And that is precisely what you get. Right, so you get real-time hemispheric lateralization for feed-forward versus feedback control signals. So here, so take for instance the alpha signal, which is you know roughly outlined here, between these regions, like a vocal motor control region and an auditory region. Uh, here, the vertical line is the onset of the planned speech, even though this is all the mere idea. Right? This is the mere in your head. 
you get a leftward lateralization just before and a rightward lateralization just after, as a pre, a, like a prediction that's, for instance, the, the DIVA model would make, but other, you know, it's very, very particular. You can see it in different kind of analysis, just looking straight forward at the weighted phase-like index and so on. And then you can look more fine-grained in. You can say, well, let's look at all possible connections. Uh, in, you know, here's what happens before. The, so this is during the plan. And so it's some, you know, here's the connectivity of that. Here it is right afterward. Remember, after doesn't mean there's a sound. After means there's the imagined generation of the sound. It's still just silence. So even though you say, I'm going to plan something, the, the silent plan generates an auditory signal in an auditory coordinate system. So there must be some transformation. And here you see it in the other direction. And you have sensory motor integration. So in conclusion to this, to do this, you really need high temporal resolution. You need to know where you are. And what you find is that there are motor representations that are for consonants and auditory representations for vowels just in the thought of those uh, speech items. And you can then differentiate where particular computations might be done. So in conclusion, you can do stuff at the input that gives you very clear messages about how phonemic information might be processed, how syllabic information might be processed. You can do things about structural representation in the kind of core language system. And you can do uh, something about interesting, uh, learn interesting features of speech motor control models and how they might be organized in, in doing stuff. Um, so to have a credible theory uh, of these kinds of processes, you have to have temporal resolution. You want to know where you are. And so to have a credible neurobiology, you really want to have this kind of signal available to you. And with that, I'll leave you to Leila Isaac. Thanks.